Okay, cost cutting through standardization. So how many of you are feeling the pressure to become more efficient with emergency department practice and delivery of care? This is my question to gauge how interactive you will be. Remember, we're going we're gonna to engage patients to be more involved in their care. A lot of people are like, oh, great. Thank God that we'll relieve us of some of the burden. We don't have to make all the decisions. Others are like, oh, my God, I have to interact with them more? Does this mean I actually have to have eye contact with them? I don't want to do that. That's going to be crazy. And I don't need somebody else mucking up the decisions I'm making. But this is going to be a good idea. It really is. So let's talk about, first of all, why. The why for standardization. Now, a few years ago for Sherry, I gave a similar discussion but it was for different reasons. We have some really compelling reasons now that are financial and quality related to make sure that we really address standardization. So we've got direct financial incentive. Anyone heard of the value-based purchasing program? Value-based modifiers. I don't know that I want to be modified, but that's what's happening. What I've heard when I talk to people in different places, there's still a lot of confusion about these programs. There are two programs. Value-based purchasing is on the hospital side. Value-based modifiers are on the physician side, and it's coupled with PQRS, Physician Quality Reporting System. So there are actually two different systems. There are two ways we can be hurt with this. So direct financial incentive. There's indirect financial incentive. So if we get better at what we do, we find an irrefutable best practice and a way to do things, and we implement that, we can be more efficient, we can see more patients. So there's a direct incentive to do that. And also with the inpatient quality reporting system and the outpatient quality reporting system, okay, IPPS and OPPS, we can be better with those measures as well for CMS if we standardize around the items that we really need to, to standardize. There's overall cost reduction that helps us also. Now let me ask you a question. With all the discussion and rhetoric from the federal government, the Affordable Care Act, CMS, PQRS, IPPS, OPPS, to make care better and to reduce cost, what do you think the primary initiative is of all of those programs? It's to reduce cost. For who? Absolutely. I, I honestly, I know that sounds cynical. And it, and it is cynical, but it's also true from my perspective. Of course, most cynics see it from their perspective, don't they? But I do see it that way that every time in the past five years from the federal government, I've seen an initiative that they say is to improve quality it's reduced cost for us first, and if you can happen to maintain quality or improve it along the way, well, good for you. And maybe we'll pay you to do that also. And if you don't accomplish it, which is what I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, maybe we're going to pay you a little bit less. This is all about reducing costs, reducing the deficit. All right, so let's talk about the national strategy for the value-based purchasing program. What do they want to do? They want to make care safer, reducing harm. They want to get the patients engaged and involved in their own care, which is a good thing. They haven't said how they want us to do it, just do it. Promote effective communication and coordination of care. Effective prevention and treatment for the leading causes of mortality. So what are those? They're talking CHF, COPD, coronary artery disease, and what's the biggie? Diabetes. The stats on diabetes are amazing. They're astounding. They want to work with communities to promote best practices and healthy living. I think there's a conspiracy out there. That's where I think Hostess went. Hostess, if you read the whole Affordable Care Act, they had to get rid of Twinkies. And so people would, would eat better. So Twinkies are gone. Another funny story, I'm like, my 12-year-old, he was 11 a month ago, so we are in the car coming back from a soccer game, and he's like, we're, we heard about it on the radio again. He said, I've never had a Twinkie. I'm like, are you kidding me? They're not that great, but you can't go through life never having a Twinkie. I pulled into the first convenience store gas station place. He goes, what are you doing? I'm getting you your first and your last Twinkie. I walk in there, and the guy gets all emotional with me. Sir, hostess is gone. We don't have Twinkies anymore. I'm like, all right, fine. So I had to tell my son, you're just going to have to Google them or something. You, you will never have a Twinkie. But it will help the overall, the overall health of the United States. It will help because Twinkies are gone. I think it was part of the Affordable Care Act. I right, want to make quality care more affordable for individuals, families, et cetera, and hopefully that will happen. I'm not sure if we'll get there or not. What are some of the stats? Now, these are compelling. A third of care is delivered on the hospital side. It's hospital-based. More than 15% of Medicare beneficiaries have a bad outcome, have an error, an adverse event that happens due to their hospitalization, not associated with the illness they came in for, something we decided to add on to it a little bit. So errors do happen. A third require readmission within 30 days. That's a problem also. 
and take a look at what they're going to do with this program, which is kind of scary. So they want baseline data. They've already gotten it, 2009 to 2010. The performance period, which people are very frustrated about, is July 2011 to March 2012. How many of you want to impact the performance data at this point, becoming more familiar with it this year? It's too late. The, performance, the initial performance period has come and gone. They're going to judge us, at least on the hospital side, through clinical processes of care, 70% weighted, and patient experience of care, 30%. If you, is anyone familiar with the term patient satisfaction? Yes, you are. Well, it's get rid of it, it's gone. It's now experience of care. Now, we hope you have a good experience in our emergency department and our hospital. We want you to be satisfied, but it's about your experience of care. But there'll be no Twinkies, no sweets, nothing like that. We want you to live healthy. So what else? I want to show you this formula. This is amazing. I, am, I know there are a lot of smart people in this room. But I don't know if anyone is smart enough to figure out this formula. I've looked at it a few times. I only list it here not to explain it to you, but just to let you know there's some real voodoo stuff going into the calculations they're going to make about how they're going to pay on the hospital side through value-based purchasing. Look at this. Nine times hospital performance period score minus the achievement threshold divided by the benchmark minus the achievement threshold. Oh, and in case we screwed it up, we'll add a 0.5. It's a fudge factor. I have no idea what that means, and I don't know how to apply that to anything. Does anyone in here feel confident that they're like, yeah, I get it, it's going to be good or bad? <laughs> Raise your hand, I'm going to ask you to explain it to everyone, so be careful. All right, yeah, I don't think anyone gets it. Now, what, what measures are out there right now that are applicable to the emergency department that are going to be measured under the value-based purchasing program? They're right here. We're talking about MI measures, thrombolytics, PCI. Hey, we've got pneumonia, 3B. This is interesting, too. So are we getting blood cultures in the emergency department? I'll throw this out there, which is a value, I think, to you, is that CMS, a little over a year ago, said, hey, wait a minute, you've misunderstood the measure. We're not saying that everybody needs to have blood cultures in the emergency department who has community-acquired pneumonia who's being admitted. And I can show you the quote from them because it is very difficult to find it on their website, but I have it from a presentation I did last year. What they said was, if you are going to do blood cultures, then they need to be done before the antibiotics. But if you choose not to do the blood cultures, that's okay. So that measure 3B is not so ugly as we thought it was before, and maybe why we can tolerate its existence a little bit longer, knowing that blood cultures provide nothing of value to the patient and the system, except if you look at the data, probably 48 hours longer of an admission by the time we sort out the false positives that they have. So it doesn't help them, but at least we don't have to do it. And there are a few others here we'll list as well. What antibiotics are we giving them? Pre-surgical antibiotics, the choice of pre-surgical antibiotics, I think these are areas we can benefit um, patients as well. You know, in the past, I used to say, hey, you got appendicitis, I'd throw a, um, a second or third generation cephalosporin on board right now, as soon as I diagnosed it. Now I know it's a waste, because they need to do it within an hour of scalpel time. So I'm like, they're going to get it anyway, or if they decide not to do it, then they've not complied with the measure, but I document that I'm deferring it based on either this measure or deferring it to, to make sure it's done closer to proximity of the surgical intervention. I'm not forgetting, I'm making an active decision not to do it. If you're not gonna do it in your institutions, then make sure it's there in policy or your providers are documenting that appropriately. And then we've got HCAPS too. And don't think that we were completely exempted on the ED side and the outpatient side, we were, but now they're gonna develop patient experience surveys, patient care experience surveys for us too, not just on the inpatient side. All right, so let's switch gears. Value-based payment modifier. How are they gonna make us better modify our payment? You know, just the big things here, and I don't want this to become a big reimbursement discussion, but it is a big piece of this discussion. You know, the big changes are, this is coupled with PQRS, and if you don't comply, there are going to be serious problems. So by 2015, we already know that the incentives turn into penalties if you're not providing your data and, and submitting data for PQRS, right? We're all aware of that. What some people are not aware of is that this value-based modifier is coupled to PQRS and also in 2015, based on claims submitted this year, will you also get nailed with a penalty for the value-based modifier if you're not submitting under PQRS. So there's a 2.5% penalty instead of a 1.5%. So they've actually almost doubled up the penalty on us because they added this additional piece. Groups that have greater than 100 providers must, by October 15th of this year, they have to declare themselves. They have to apply 
for some sort of group reporting, whether it's web interface or, or whether it's EHR. You can do an administrative claims reporting, but what you can't do anymore as a group greater than 100, and eventually it will be everyone. That's what CMS has done in the past. That's the history, right? So groups 2 to 99 will be next. You will not be able to do anymore traditional claims-based reporting under PQRS if you have a group that is greater than or equal to 100 providers. And that includes advanced practice providers, non-physician providers, so PAs, advanced practice nurses. It's not just physicians. So be aware of that. You can't miss this deadline or you will automatically get the penalty. And um, our recommendation through some committees at ASEP and, and elsewhere is you might want to opt in initially for the administrative claims option because right now we don't know where this is headed and how it's going to look. The administrative claims option only includes some of those high-hitting chronic diseases I mentioned before. So the N for charts for us will be zero. There is no penalty. And that will go away for us. We won't be allowed to slip through for too much longer. But a couple years of sitting on the fence and watching is probably the way to go. So I would recommend the administrative claims option. They have this tiered option, which is kind of interesting too. So you can say, hey, you can benefit up to, we, we predict maybe up to 5% increase in your reimbursement, but you could get some money taken away too. And they're also based on chronic conditions and things that are not applicable to the emergency department. And the, we really recommend that, that people who are submitting claims for emergency medicine don't do that because we don't know how that's going to play out. That's supposed to be a budget neutral system. That means they're planning on enough people losing to fund paying the people who win. And I think, based on what I've seen so far with CMS, that means everybody's going to lose and more money's going to go into the bank to reduce the deficit. That's what I think is going to happen. So be careful with the tiering option for now. I just want to call your attention to the bottom of the slide, potential penalties under PQRS. In 2015, 2.5%. 2 2016, based on 2014 claims submitted, it's going to be 3%. If you are not submitting, Claims data under PQRS, you've got to get it done, or you're going to get a double whammy here, a double hit. I think it was 2010 data. Um, emergency medicine had the greatest penetration in PQRS participation. It was about 65%. Cardiology, I think, was 32 or 33%. Interestingly enough, uh, of dollars um, remitted or sent out in bonus payments, emergency medicine had, I think, about 9.9 or 10% of the total dollars, but cardiology had 12.6%. So even though they had less penetration, they're getting, giving them higher dollars, it sounds like. I'm not sure exactly what those measures were, but they were doing pretty well. So be aware the penalties are out there. Now the fun stuff. Was, well, did anyone think that was fun? Because then you've been completely fulfilled. I saw one person scratch their head, one person you know, uh, put a hat on or something, and one person's walking out. So OK, nothing so far, right? So there's been no value. I'm just verifying, OK? That's exactly what I thought. Let me tell you about this story about this gorilla and the old couple. Be <laughs> All right, systems. So this is one thing that makes me crazy. What I want to do is give you some examples of some ways that I think that we can really bring this home and implement things within weeks, I think, within weeks, and really make a difference here. So this is an article that I found talking about pre-op evaluations. How many of our emergency departments and providers in our emergency departments are expected to initiate a preoperative evaluation? A patient, let's say, with a hip fracture, let's use that, for the orthopedist or whoever. If you've got a hip fracture, how many times does the radiology tech say, do you want me to get a chest x-ray while I have them over here? And how many times do we say yes? You know, any of these questions you can actually respond to. It would be okay, they're not all rhetorical. So does this happen or not, or should we just move on? So we're ordering EKGs, we're ordering labs, we're ordering coags, we're ordering um, chest x-rays on patients who really don't need it. And I'll give you some of the data that explains why we don't need it and it's not cost effective and why it's a big problem for us. It doesn't make any difference. For us, what do we need? What test do we need to diagnose a hip fracture in the emergency department? Anyone know? You guys are so smart. Yes, a hip x-ray. And if they didn't have syncope, if they tripped over their cat or slipped on the soap, whatever it is, then we don't need to be getting all these other tests. We really don't. Are they going to be needed? Some of them will be, some of them won't be. But I tell you what, for us to do it makes us inefficient from a cost standpoint and from an operational standpoint. When you're waiting for your troponin to come back and you're mad at your lab, don't be mad. You just ordered a whole battery of tests on somebody who didn't need them emergently because they need surgical clearance when the person's going to see them and write their consult 12 hours from now or longer. OK, so let's look at this data. I love this one. So take a look at hip fractures. 
got cardiac evaluation, an echo or a nuclear stress of some kind, none of them had any intervention or really changed the orthopedic management, none of them, okay? There was a delay, 3.3 days versus 1.9 days who didn't get these tests done. To the tune of, this is back in 2007 when this was published, $47 million annually. Is that a waste when there's no value? I think it's a waste. Look at this next article just for office-based sedation for um, oral maxillofacial surgery. $100 per patient, $2.9 billion annually. Well, just let me make sure you're not going to bleed a lot, so I'll get a CBC and I think I'll get an INR and a PTPTT on you. It's not necessary. There's no value in this. And here's the big concern I have for us. When we do this, when we facilitate the admission process and the medical clearance process, whose NPI number does the order go under? Anybody venture to guess? I'm not moving forward until somebody says something. It can't be Sherry, okay? Go write a book, okay? All right, so, yeah, it's the emergency physicians. We, we just go ahead and our, our unit clerks or secretaries put it in under our name and our provider number. So does that make us look less efficient? If we just need an x-ray to diagnose a hip fracture, we look great. We just ordered an x-ray. We are so efficient. When we have to spend another $4,000 on preoperative evaluation, I'm guessing, I have no idea what it is, but a lot of money, it's like, wow, it takes them a lot of money to figure out they have a broken hip. That's how it looks to the federal government and third-party payers. The era of facilitating care in that way must end. Should we still do it if they want it? Yes. Should, we, should it be protocol driven? Should it, should it really be complaint specific? That's what the data says. So let's put it in protocol and let's make sure it's complaint specific. Let's not just order everything on everybody. And let's also make sure this is in an order set that goes to the ordering physician, not the person who already had the information they needed. I'm not going to clear them for surgery. I don't need that data. I'm not taking responsibility for it, and nor do I want to check those tests later. That's another issue. I ordered it. Nobody checks it. I'm responsible for it. So let's put policies in place where we order it, but we put it on the appropriate provider's MPI number, the admitting physician, and that's what I recommend we do. All right. Does anyone find that useful even a little bit? Okay. If you don't, you only have, based on the timer up here, 11 minutes and 34 seconds left to lunch. So hang in there. Individual medical practices. Do we have variability in physician and provider practice out there? Thank you. Thank you very much. I needed you. Where were you earlier? Yeah. All right. But we have a lot of variation. There are some, I'm going to give you some examples of things we can do better. I, don't you love this? I'm kind of offended because if I were in that relationship, I would clearly be Robin. I would not be Batman. I don't like being slapped. All right, so kidney stones. This makes me absolutely crazy. Every shift I work, I worked two days ago. And why, why do you not want to get a CAT scan on this person? They, they clearly have a kidney stone. Exactly. <laughs> They've had five to six kidney stones in their lifetime. And here's part of it. Well, their spouse works at the hospital, and they're wondering why we aren't doing more tests. That's a conversation. That's not a checkbox on the chart. But I'm going to give you some data. I think this is pretty interesting stuff. So look at Journal of Emergency Medicine, 1999. And I'm going to give you some additional data, too, on cost. They said at that time, about 600 bucks for the CT. And um, if you look at newchoicehealth.com, and these are charges, not costs, so be careful. For the CT of the abdomen, about 1,900 bucks. For the CT of the pelvis, $2,000. And it, this, there, there are ranges all over the place based on zip code and third-party payers. And the healthcare cost utilization project from AHRQ, uh, brief number 139, really framed how frequent people come to the ED for kidney stones. Look at this. In 2009, 1.3 million ED visits for kidney stones. That's a lot of people. So we can make a big impact here. That's 3,600 daily visits. Even if we said that the the cost, the actual cost was only going to be $1,000 for that CT abdomen pelvis, which is probably more in line, not, you know, $3,000. And look at those visits, that $3.6 million a day. A day, not a year, a day. Could somebody do something valuable with $3.6 million a day? Yeah, absolutely. And $1.3 billion annually. Now ask yourself, is there at least one CAT scan a month that you think you could avoid, knowing that you already had the answer? The patient was not at risk for something bad happening. Why do we order a CAT scan sometimes? What are we worried about missing? This is not a rhetorical question. The AAA, exactly. 
All right, so let's look at some data here, and this will help you, I think. So take a look at some data, some demographics on AAAs. Almost 6,400 men and women aged 25 to 84, 1994 to 95, more common in men than women. AAA, 8.9% of men, 2.2% of women. So that already tells us something. Women are less likely to have a AAA. What about the risks? Well, if you smoked, you had 40 pack years, your odds ratio for AAA was eight. Smoking is huge. They said low HDL also, but also coronary artery disease we know is a risk factor. So be aware of that also. What was amazing from this study was no one, not one person under the age of 48 had a AAA. That helps me. So if you're 50, I'm like, all right, maybe I got, if you've never had a stone before, or I'm worried, I, I've got to go ahead and get the CT. But if you're 25, what are the chances of you having a AAA? How much do you smoke? Six packs a day. Well, all right, maybe you've gotten there, but it's unlikely what I'm saying. <laughs> How do you have that much time? My job is to smoke. I, I don't know. I don't know. So what's the next step then? How do we diagnose it? Is a urine good enough? Hey, you have symptoms that sound like a kidney stone. And it's in the back, it's colicky, radiates around to the front, you're nauseated, diaphoretic, it waxes and wanes, it sounds like a kidney stone. And hey, you've had the same pain before when they told you you had a kidney stone. So great, maybe we confirm it with a urine. I'll go through this quickly, but basically, if you add the dip and add a micro to it, you've got about, for both of these studies that I have listed here, about 5% of people are not gonna have any blood in their urine even though they have a stone. Look at this additional study, 1999. They said, wait, 11% of people with a stone had no blood there. Okay, so maybe up to 11, but these other two studies are more compelling and well-designed, and they say about 5%. What was interesting here, they said eight patients that actually had a little blood didn't have kidney stones. They had something else, but I will share with you that those were incidental findings that didn't need to be found that day because nothing was done with them. They were incidental, and they were probably something, not that they would die from, but die with. So it wasn't important they were found. Some people say, wait, you can have blood in the urine, and it's because they had the AAA with a dissection, and there's a dissection into the renal artery. Have you ever heard that? It's true, but rare. Look at this article. Journal Vascular Surgery back in 1995. So yeah, it happens, but it has to be an aortocable fistula, and it only happens in 2 to 4% of ruptured AAAs. So you're in pretty good shape if you say, you've got blood in your urine. It's not from the ruptured AAA. And if it is a ruptured AAA, I hope that your clinical acumen will lead you closer to the right diagnosis. You know, hypotension or something else, an 80-year-old that's never had a kidney stone, something else is going to lead you to get the right test. But I hope this data is compelling enough to say, we don't need a CT in a lot of these patients. Urine is probably enough. You're young and healthy, and particularly if you've had previous stones and you have identical symptoms, quit ordering the CAT scans, and you'll save a bunch of money and time. Incidentals, how about IV fluids? Well, how we hydrate these people. Well, they're vomiting with their kidney stone. Yeah, for 45 minutes, how much have they been vomiting? They're not dehydrated yet. So $159.95 for the start and the initial fluids, $60 each additional hour, two hours, $220. Look at the same data that we looked at for frequency of visits for kidney stones. Daily, we're spending $800,000 on IV fluids that most of these people don't need. It doesn't flush the stone out. None of that works. $286 million annually. So we can get rid of the stones, or get rid of the IV fluids for stones. The incidental treatment is not helpful. Knee radiographs. Well, we know about the Ottawa rules. I, th I swear, I think Ian Steele is going to have to go on some Prozac or something. Everyone ignores his data. I don't know any department that is using Ottawa ankle rules and knee rules, and we should. Here are the parameters. I'm not going to insult you by reading those. You probably are familiar with them, and you can take a look at them at your leisure if you'd like to review them. But if you can avoid these films, here's what can happen. They said they reduced radiographic evaluation of knees by 26%. The time in the ED was substantially reduced. That helps us probably more than anything else. Time in the ED is golden to us. And the cost was reduced. So let's do it. And there was no bad outcome with something missed on an e film. Here's a calculation I did for you. Just at Medicare rates, getting the film and having it interpreted somewhere around $63. If there are about 4,000 EDs in the country, just as a round number, and every ED did one less knee series a day for a year, what would that save us? $91 million. And I'm talking to people who twist their knee and say, I twisted it and it hurts. Do you think they broke it when they twisted it? They didn't break it. You can even ask them. And this is what I do with them too, early in the visit. So do you think you've broken anything? Oh, no, I'm sure I, I didn't break anything. Okay, I'll get back to that. So then we're talking and we figure out what we're going to do. And then they either ask why they're not getting an x-ray or I just jump right in and say, you might be wondering why I haven't talked about an x-ray. 
X-rays only show the bones. You and I have already agreed you don't have a broken bone. So why expose you to the unnecessary radiation? And I've changed that talk a little bit, and it's more effective now. I've added the word ionizing, and I pause. The unnecessary ionizing <laughs> radiation. They don't want the x-ray anymore at all, so they're out. How about some systems? Let's do this. What two things do patients hate to experience? We've experienced two, and we hate them also. Pain and what other symptom? <laughs> what, what, what did you guys say over here? It's nausea is the right answer, okay? Pain and nausea, okay. So let's take a look at some data using Ondansetron. The reason I mention Ondansetron is because it's available in the oral disintegrating tablet, and that's why I think it's very helpful. Here's a great randomized controlled trial in kids. They had already failed oral hydration, okay? They failed it, ages 1 to 10, 0.15 milligram per kilo. They were given a dose, and then retrial oral rehydration 30 minutes later. 11 of the 51 failed. 30 of the 55 placebo group failed and had to be admitted. And this is after they already tried oral rehydration. What if we started this up front at triage? Admission rates were substantially lower in those that got the ondansetron. Let's get them feeling better. If I'm busy, and I'll ask the nurses, is anyone in the waiting room nauseated besides a triage nurse? A round of ondansetron on, on me, I'm not going to hurt anybody. If they get back to the back and they feel better, then I'm going to discharge them. Now, the Canadian Pediatric Society, is, they're very smart, although they spell pediatrics wrong. They put in extra letters in there. But they say, between six, and 12, six months and 12 years, you should do this. Here's the breakdown of dosage based on their weight. And they, should, they say, start oral rehydration attempts 15 to 30 minutes after. This is a clinical guideline published in 2011. We should be doing this. Here's another great article that says, annually, if we do this, we will save almost 30,000 IV starts, over 7,000 hospital missions for kids, and $61 million a year in unnecessary treatment because we gave a pill under the tongue? Are you kidding me? This is easy. This is simple. Let's put this into place. How about CPKMB? How many of your panels have not just a troponin, but they still have an MB in them? Well, an MB does not add anything. Thank you for letting me know. A lot of people do. And the MB does not add anything to the troponin whatsoever, not a thing. And as a matter of fact, 12 to 39% based on the literature out there that have negative MBs will have a positive troponin, so it's not sensitive enough. So some of those patients you think have unstable angina, they actually have a non-STEMI, and that's concerning. So let's look at this data from the CDC, non-traumatic chest pain. 2007 to 2008, 10% of the visits in emergency departments in the United States were for non-traumatic chest pain, 5.5 million annually. And if we look at the range of cost of an MB, anywhere between about nine bucks to a charge of $188. Crazy, isn't it? Let's just say it's 10 bucks. Let's bring the number of visits way down to two million. We save $2 billion annually if we stop ordering this test that adds nothing Nothing to the visit, nothing to the evaluation whatsoever. I know some places have gone away from it, but we still have a lot of people that are still doing it. So additional options. Here's some things to think about that you might want to work on as initiatives at your location. No pre-reduction radiographs for shoulder dislocations. Schuster's article and many others say, we know when it's dislocated, we can tell clinically. So go ahead and reduce it. Some people say, well, wait, what if there's a fracture there? Well, it's okay if there's a fracture there because you still need to reduce the dislocation. If you feel the deficit here, it's, it's absolutely dislocated. And ask the patient. They want it back in place. Now, if you ask, I've asked a, you know, an orthopedist friend of mine, what do you want us to do? He said, you know, don't call us and act, don't get the x-ray first. Just go ahead and tug on it, and it'll go back into place. Now, I also have a urology friend, and I would not take that advice from him. <laughs> Never would not do that. But the orthopedist, yes, and it works. You put it back in place. I tell the patient in advance, you see how gentle this was, or you were asleep, and I will tell you it was very gentle. We put it back in place. Anything we see on the post-reduction x-ray probably happened from the violent force of when this came out, not when I put it back in. And you just prep them that way. You don't need sedation. If you use some good techniques like the Cunningham technique, works great. We're running out of time, so I won't tell you how to do the Cunningham technique. But the last several I've done, that's the only technique I used in the last year. It is amazing. I worked two days ago. And they thought I was crazy. I went in to see this gentleman. It's a great story. I'm going to use this for a long time. He was 18, playing basketball. A guy came down on his arm, and he, he wanted pain relief. And I said, you know, if we can bond for a couple seconds, 30 seconds, I can try this technique, and I think I can get you out of pain and put it back in place. And his mom was there. They looked at me like, 
or you're going to do like spread herbs on them or something. They were like, and I'm like, I hear it because people always look at me weird when I do this. I said, I got to massage your shoulder. So now I'm telling you how to do it. I'm putting downward pressure on the forearm. He's holding my forearm. You got to tell him to relax. The minute he takes a deep breath and relaxes, and I'm massaging the trapezius down to the deltoid, down to the bicep. I stop there. I'm not willing to go any further for this procedure. And all of a sudden, I get to, I've never gone past the deltoid. I get to the deltoid and clunk, it goes back in place. And this 18-year-old guy looks up at me and looks at my eyes, and I swear this is true also. God, I love you, man. <laughs> and it was like an awkward, it was like a, you know, that, what is that, that commercial with the, the, the tree and the tickets? The, the ticket oak? I was like, yeah, I love you too, man. And it was like really weird. I'm like, okay, yeah, I love you too. I'm glad you're back in place. I'm going to order the x-ray now. He didn't need anything else. He was out of there in 30 minutes. And I realized, you know, when I do this, the value of not using sedation and getting them home sooner. The PCARN rules for pediatric head trauma. Cooperman did a great job. We can avoid a lot of CTs of the head. No LS spine x-rays for non-red flag back pain. They don't have a fever, no new neural symptoms. They don't have indwelling catheters, something that would indicate there's a serious problem or a potential metastasis. We shouldn't be ordering x-rays when someone lifts a couch and it hurts their back. There's, there's great opportunity there as well. No head CT for syncope. If they had a normal neuro exam when they came into the ED and they had no neuro symptoms before they had their syncope episode, it is not a neuro problem. It really is not. This article says that it's a rare, rare cause of syncope. Stroke is a rare cause of syncope. You don't need to do it. And the auto ankle rules, and then no convenient urinary catheters. I don't want to get out of bed to pee. Can you put a catheter in me? Sorry, that's going away. There's some regulation on this too, so we really can't do that. Well, we're almost done. I want to encourage you to never give up. Keep you know, fighting the good fight to reduce cost and standardize. And it's time for lunch. Thanks, everybody.